We have the next speaker uh, talking about uh, web monetization. Very exciting uh, talk. Uh, Stefan Thomas, founder and CEO at Koi. All right, thank you very much. Um, wow, so thank you so much to both Karen and Rachel for that um, amazing sort of lead-in. Uh, couldn't have asked for a better setup for my talk. Um, a lot of the things have been mentioned around um, you know, ads or uh, how monetization has been challenging, how payments have been challenging on the web is exactly what I'm, what I'm planning to talk about. Uh, so very quickly, uh, my name is Stefan Thomas. I am the founder and CEO of Coil. Um, before uh, Coil, was just started last year. Um, I was the chief technology officer at Ripple. Um, before that, I was a um, contributor to Bitcoin. I wrote the first JavaScript implementation of Bitcoin. I also worked a lot in Bitcoin advocacy and kind of getting uh, the word out about cryptocurrency. Um, I'm actually, you know, since then become somewhat disillusioned in terms of like um, the role that cryptocurrency can play. I think it's still an important p component, um, but there's just so much more that we need and a lot of it um, a lot of my focus has shifted away from cryptocurrency and more towards standardization and interoperability. Um, and I'll talk about some of that today. Um, so first of all, like, I want to start with an observation and a belief, which is today, if you look around you, um, pretty much all of you are going to have some kind of device on you right now that is connected to the internet. Um, that device can talk to, um, you know, as we heard, billions of websites around the world. Um, you can get information from any one of those websites within seconds, um, and there's almost no friction associated with that. Um, unfortunately, I have to say almost no friction because there are still some countries that are censoring, things like that. But um, in general, generally speaking, like technology-wise, we've solved that problem pretty much. Um, however, when you look at payments, the story is quite a bit different. Um, so I may have an account with one e-wallet in the US, um, but that doesn't mean I can suddenly send money to somebody in Kenya who has a mobile money account. Um, and so those are still very much proprietary silos. Um, and I always find that jarring as a web developer and somebody who works in open source software and so on. Um, every time I run into something to do with money or payments, suddenly I have to deal with proprietary APIs. Or if it's not proprietary, it might be something like um, a blockchain where it's still a very specific system or a very specific instance of a system that I'm interacting with. Um, and so there are people that are hold it, those tokens that are involved in those systems and they are ultimately the owners of those uh, entities. And so I almost look at a blockchain more as like a corporation of a different name than, than, than something truly open. Um, and so I kind of think about like, what if payments worked a little bit more like the internet? What if um, there was a um, sort of a, a transactional layer that allows us to make payments regardless of which, which system we're on, um, that allows me as a developer to write an app um, regardless of what payment systems come out in the future, or, you know, which ones are faster, which ones my users want to use. Um, can we have something like the internet but, but for money? Um, and so this is really how I feel like monetization on the web should work. So you give me the data, you give me the search result, the article, the video, whatever the case may be, the application, um, and in exchange, I pay you. Um, this shouldn't be that surprising because that's how we pay for everything else. Um, if we go to the restaurant, it's not that after you have your meal, somebody comes up to you and says like, and now a message from our sponsors. No, you just pay for your meal. If you uh, trying to leave the convenience store around the corner. It's not that they tell you about their new subscription model where you have to sign up to the convenience store and you get all your um, potato chips for free, but you have to pay a monthly fee. That would be equally ridiculous. Um, you just pay for your potato chips and you walk out. And so how come that on the internet it looks more like this, where I get the data, and then there's some convoluted way for the company that's giving me the data to make money. Either they sell information about me to some advertisers that then send me messages, or maybe I have to sign up for a recurring um, a subscription and sign up with the site and give them a bunch of personal information. And it just feels like, you know, half the time I don't bother with it, like I, I, I have to download an ad blocker and then the site doesn't work and then I get a pop-up saying, hey, using ad blocker, you gotta stop this. It just feels like a very, very high friction, highly broken system. And so it's kind of interesting to think about how do we get here? Like, why is it like this? Why isn't it more like that first picture? 
And so, you know, when I have, when let's say I make a website about honey badgers, I'm really interested in honey badgers. Um, the way this kind of, you know, roundaboutness of monetization manifests is that, well, you know, if my website gets really popular, I see the traffic go up, great, I'm really excited, but then I get a hosting bill all of a sudden, and like, apparently servers aren't free. Um, and so now I have to pay this hosting bill, I'm kind of like, well, you know, I kind of wish this website paid for itself, and so then I put a bunch of ads on the website, and now it looks like this. Um, and now my, my users are complaining, and so, and so I'm just not having a good time. Like, and, and sort of, this is a you know, bit of a joke, but at the same time, there's some real issues with ads. Things like user tracking privacy, um, the fact that they consume a lot of bandwidth. Um, there was one really fun article that I saw um, where they basically looked at, um, given a certain cost for mobile traffic um, that, they, that they used as an example, um, they looked at how much money you're paying for the bandwidth to download the ad versus how much the publisher is making with the ad. And it turned out that in, in, in at least a few edge cases, like you were actually paying more for the bandwidth to download all the ads and the trackers than the publisher was actually making off of you. And so, in that case, really, you should be paying for it in yourself instead of going through all this, this nonsense. Um, and yeah, of course, like, how do we solve this? Well, um, you know, a lot of people use an ad blocker as sort of a self-help solution. Um, you know, 25% is a lot of people. Um, that's like one quarter. Um, okay, that's a bit obvious statement, but, um, but that number is growing, number, first of all, and then second of all, it's very un, uneven. So if you're a website that's catering to gamers, for example, some of the people we've talked to, they're seeing 60% app block usage. In one case, we heard 80% app block usage, and that's where it starts to get kind of hard to monetize your website purely on ads. And so people are looking for other solutions, and I kind of mentioned subscriptions already, they're taking off. Um, they just crossed uh, cable as the most uh, popular way to access online, uh, access video. Um, and so it's kind of like, okay, well maybe subscriptions are the answer. But of course subscriptions are pretty high friction, like I have to actually sign up for the subscription. Um, and so now people are starting to get annoyed at that. And so like I have to have a Netflix subscription, and I have to, have, Disney Plus just came out, I have to have a Disney Plus subscription, and I'm gonna have to have a Peacock subscription, and a CBS All Access, and like 100 other subscriptions. And so eventually I'm gonna get annoyed by that, and then also I have to manage all of that, right? Like every time I stop watching a show, I have to unsubscribe, and if I forget that I'm paying a bunch of money for a thing that I don't use. Um, so it's not really a great solution either. Um, and one thing that's sort of very personal in me is that if I'm an individual web developer, I have no chance of competing with Disney Plus. You know, like people are gonna sign up for Disney Plus, they're not gonna sign up for my little app. You know, unless like I have this really hardcore set of fans that really need this app. Um, and so there's a bunch of uh, problems with this as well. So if you look at the actual HTTP spec, and that's really the foundation of the web, it's like how do we request a website? Um, it's one of the foundational technologies. And th there is sort of this reference, which you know, unfortunately I don't know enough about it, and I, I hope maybe somebody in the room knows more about it and can come up to me and tell me a little bit about the history, but if you look at it, it says, you know, there's an error code, 402, that's reserved for future use. You know, we were kind of talking about, uh, thinking back to 1999, this is 1989, or, uh, I mean, HDP1, I think it's 1989. Um, but basically, all the way, 30 years ago, people have been thinking about, like, the web should have some payments thing built in, and we'll just reserve this, and somebody will figure it out. Um, and, but nobody did, <laughs> you know, like, we're still in the exact same situation where we have these workarounds, but we don't have a native, open, you know, freely available solution that for to this problem. So what we really need is some protocol, some underlying solution for how money can move around um, that we can plug into. So the, inter the, the web is built on top of the internet. Um, we need something like that, but for value transfer, like if we need an internet for money. And so the question is, well, how do we do that? Um, and that's the question that we asked ourselves, um, you know, four years ago when we started the Interledger Community Group um, and Interledger, as the name implies, it's exactly that. It's trying to be an internet, but instead of moving um, data around, it's trying to be uh, an internet working, but for ledgers, i.e. payments. Um, and so we had a number of different uh, meetups where we brought people together. Um, we have uh, about 300 uh, plus members, um, making us the, the third largest community group um, at W3C. So it's clearly a lot of interest. Um, and we kind of systematically worked on this problem for several years. And then last year we got to a point where some of the core protocols felt pretty stable. And so now we're kind of ready to actually apply this technology in practice. But I'll tell you a little bit about how it works. Um, so 
without getting super into the weeds and super technical, just like the internet is a layered architecture, so is Interledger. Um, Interledger is sort of built around this very minimal interoperability layer, which is called the Interledger protocol. And you can, if you're familiar with TCP IP, that would be sort of the IP equivalent. Um, and what it does is essentially it's designed to route little packets of money. So um, if I'm a company that's participating in this network, I might peer with other companies. Um, we might send these little packets um, around and all the packets have an amount. Um, and so at the end of the month or in whatever cycle, uh, we add up all the amounts and then I send that, those other companies the, the real money that I owe them or they send me the money that they owe me. Um, and that's really all there is to it. Um, we were actually investigating if we could, instead of inventing a new protocol, kind of extend the internet protocol, um, but you get into kind of fitting a square peg in a round hole, it didn't quite work that way, but um, we, we definitely took a lot of ideas from the sort of internet protocol stack. Um, and what's really powerful about an abstraction layer is if I want to build an application, um, I can build it uh, uh, somewhere on top. So um, stream would kind of be your TCP equivalent. Um, so it solves some of the, the general problems you always run into when you're sending money over the Interledger network. Things like what if a packet of money gets lost? I have to resend it. Um, what if there's some uh, congestion and I need to slow down? Things like that. Um, and so just like TCP is, is the basis for a lot of applications on, on the internet, um, stream is the basis for a lot of applications on Interledger. Or if I want something even easier, um, I can build on top of SPSP. Now that's kind of your, you could say, call it your HTTP equivalent, right? It's something that solves some common problems like how do I authenticate who I'm sending money to and how do I make sure the money got there and what if um, my payment gets interrupted and I need to restart it and what if I need to exchange some metadata about the payment and so on. Um, but if I disagree with any of the design choices in SPSP and Stream, I don't have to throw out the entire stack. I can throw out that protocol and make my own version of Stream or make a, a different protocol that still uses ILP. Um, and so by making ILP the sort of very minimal standard, um, you create interoperability for financial applications. And so as a developer, if I build something um, and somebody comes up with a fancy new cryptocurrency or something totally new that we're not even contemplating right now, um, it could basically be built into um, uh, these lower layers. So you can make an alternative to those lower layers, um, and so it would be able to, my application would still work on top of that. Just like you know, some app I wrote on top of TCP IP two decades ago now works over Wi-Fi 6, which just came out. You know? um, and so there's a couple of things that are um, kind of unique to Interledger if you're familiar with other kinds of payments. Um, and so one of them is that, um, well, because of, everything's sort of packetized and we're sending these little packets, um, we can do things in a continuous fashion. So rather than having to you know, pay 30 cents every time we do a payment, like it might be the case with credit card networks, um, I can send a very small increment of a payment and I can do so continuously if I want to pay for some continuous process. Now what could be an example of that? Well, it could be like a streaming video, for example. Like I, I'm, I'm watching a video and I can, rather than paying ahead of time when I don't know if I'm gonna watch the whole thing, or paying afterwards when the content provider doesn't know if I'm actually gonna pay or not, um, I can pay while I'm watching it. And so there's none of those issues in terms of who pays first or um, what happens first. Um, another kind of um, quirk of that is that, well, if I want to do a larger payment, just like when I send a larger file over the internet, that file, or in this case the payment, will get split into smaller packets. And so um, this is like a whole process that happens. Now, I kind of want to explain a little bit of why that happens, because um, it is one of the um, things that is harder to wrap your head around when you first work with the protocol. And this was basically, originally we tried to design Interledger to handle these vastly different packet sizes. So um, at my uh, employer that I worked for at Ripple, we were doing payments um, in the tens of millions of dollars for a single payment. Um, and of course, the protocol that you design for that is very different than the protocol that you design for a fraction of a cent micropayment, you know? And if you wanna build the internet for money, it has to really be able to handle both. It can't just be use case specific for only micropayments, you know? Um, and so we started thinking about how to solve that issue and you know, sure enough, like looking at the internet, it's a pretty elegant solution to say like, well, what is a large file? Well, it's just a, a chain of small files put together, right? And so what we can do is we can at the endpoints handle this um, difference and then in the middle it just looks always like a huge stream of payments going through. 
And of course, if you're from the financial industry, you probably have a million questions around regulation and things like that. Um, happy to get into some of those, but also kind of constrained on time. So I'm, I'm very excited to chat with you offline as well if you're interested in that. Um, and so what's really cool is with this IntelliJ protocol, uh, we can now go back to the original use case that we we're talking about, which is paying for stuff on the web. Suddenly, we have the capability to just pay for every page view or pay for every second of video that I'm watching. Um, we have the, the ability to pay on that granularity. Um, and so just as an example, the company that we founded is, is one of the first companies to build on Interledger. Um, and we've already made 10 billion of these tiny micropayments. We've sent 10 billion of these little packets. Um, now, that might sound like a really big number. We're still kind of working with a very small community, a very small number of users. Um, but because the rate of how often we send these payments is just so much greater than with any kind of prior payments technology, that's why we get to those big numbers. And to kind of illustrate that point, like for me, it's almost like going from fax machines to the internet. Like credit cards, they make a few hundred payments per, per card or per user. Um, in IntelliJ, you really make like millions of payments per user, at least in our case. And so what is the experience for this? Well, you have some kind of web monetized browser. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a second uh, which ones are out there. And then you go to the site, and then as you're browsing the site, there's kind of money streaming uh, to, the, to the admin of the site. Um, and the way that that works is um, we define a meta tag, uh, which the site can put into its source code, and that's how the browser knows where to pay. And then the rest is just IntelliJ. It opens a payment stream, it starts sending payment packets that way, um, and the, the website receives that as money. Um, right now, we have extensions for um, Firefox and Chrome. Uh, we also built a polyfill, although that has some important limitations because of uh, privacy features in, in some browsers. Um, which basically uh, don't allow you to detect which web monetization provider someone's using. Um, and so, so I'm not mentioning them here, or not listing them here. But um, in, the, in the sense of browser support, we have uh, Firefox and Chrome via an extension. And then there's a native browser, which is brand new, called Puma Browser, um, that implements it um, for iOS and Android kind of natively built in. Um, and that's sort of been our beachhead to get into um, sort of thinking about um, native browser support, what that would look like, what some of the challenges are, and so on. Um, here's some feedback from early adopters on the creator side, so people are definitely playing around with it. Um, what the general tenor is so far is that obviously the amounts are not huge, like there isn't you know, a billion users using web monetization today. Um, but if you kind of think about like, um, based on the number of users that are there, um, and the fact that there's very little loss along the way, and it creates a really nice user experience, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, um, it, it is really nice, and then if you extrapolate that, if more people were using that, it would be even better. Um, and so that's why you know people like me are running around and, and trying to spread the word about it. Um, but this is kind of some of the early feedback that we're getting. And so if you're a web developer, or you you're um, uh, you know uh, want to add a web monetization to your site, the basic steps are you need some kind of IntelliJ enabled wallet. And, and hopefully someday that'll be your bank account or your PayPal account. Um, but right now there's only a small number of companies that are offering IntelliJ enabled wallets. Um, the second thing is you need to add that meta tag to your site. Um, and the third, no, actually you're done. Uh, those are the only steps. Um, there is an optional third step, which is um, if users are paying you, you can actually give them some benefit. So you can reward them in some way. And that could be as simple as having a little thank you message. Hey, thanks for supporting the site. Um, it could be some extra feature, like, hey, you know, for instance, there's a site called Simmer.io, which is a, a site that hosts sort of web games, uh, HTML5-based games, and um, they added web monetization. And if you're paying, if you're a web monetization user and you go to Simmer.io, um, there's an extra button, which is the distraction-free mode, where all the other interface goes away and you just see the game. Really cool little feature, and it's sort of a thank you for anyone that's supporting the website through this standard. Um, and then. Uh, it could also be something like you know, unique content. So if you're a blogger, maybe you make some posts that are only for uh, monetized users, or something that we've played around with is this concept we call 100 plus 20, um, which is make 100% of your content free, and then make some bonus content on top of it, things like behind the scenes, or here's my research notes, or something like that. Um, and the idea behind 100 plus 20 is you're really trying to grow your audience, and that's why you want to give your content away to as many people as possible. And of course, we want the web to have lots of awesome free content. 
and when we look at sort of existing monetization models like Patreon, it's not that paying users necessarily need to, um, you know, they're not looking for like old content has to be behind a paywall, otherwise I won't pay. It's more like they want the content to exist, they're willing to support the creators, um, and the perks you get on Patreon or on other sites like it um, are just sort of a little bonus and a reminder that you are a supporter. And so it gives you that little dopamine boost for being a supporter and a patron, you know, and so um, that's a really good thing to have. And so we definitely recommend sites do something in that third category. Um, so here are some of the um, the wallet providers that already support um, Interledger. Um, if you want to, you know, obviously this is being recorded, so if you're watching this later, it might be out of date. So you can go to webmonetization.org to find out the latest list. Um, and then the tag looks something like this right now. Um, we had a great session at W3C TPAC recently where we had uh, several browser vendors show up, um, all the major ones, um, and they gave us some really good feedback on what this um, tag should look like, and so there might be some changes in the future. Um, this quasi URL might become a real URL. Uh, sorry, Sir Tim, for uh, for that oversight. Um, but basically, we're we're kind of moving the standard and hoping, hopefully, going in the right direction. Um, and then for how do you re reward the user? Um, there is a JavaScript API that's associated with the standard, um, so you can essentially um, ask the browser to tell you when it starts paying, um, and then when it starts paying, it will emit a JavaScript event. Um, again, there are some debates going on on whether it should be an event or a readable stream or whatever, um, but I'll save you those technical details. Um, and so um, you can do that, but of course, this is just JavaScript, this is all client side, and so you can't trust it entirely. So you can use this for something like removing ads, which I can already do with an ad blocker anyway, or you could use it to um, sh show a thank you message for somebody that's supporting the site, which would be pretty empty if somebody hacked it and it wasn't real. Um, but you shouldn't use it for something like premium content where you actually want to protect the content. For that, um, you should do this more secure way, which is basically um, after you get the JavaScript event from the browser, um, you, uh, you, you ha include a token and then you basically check with your backend um, before you re release the content. And again, I don't want to get super technical, so I'm kind of um, breezing through this. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, information online if you, if you follow those links. Um, and finally, in order to get this uh, going, uh, we teamed up with uh, Mozilla and Creative Commons, two organizations that sort of stood for openness on the web and open standards. Um, and uh, we basically uh, are working with them. And, and what we're doing is we're giving away $100 million um, to web developers, platforms, um, anyone who can help uh, adoption for the standard uh, to kind of help it going. And of course, that sounds like a big number, but if you think about Netflix, for example, is spending $15 billion a year on content, and that's just one provider and just in video, um, it's actually not a lot of money um, in that context, um, but we think it might be enough to convince some people that otherwise wouldn't to look into the standard and maybe spend the time to play around with it. So. That's kind of it from me, and uh, yeah, here's some links so you can find more about it. Um, Stefan, can you share your thoughts in terms of how it works, right? So I can see that, let's say, that the weight of the payment, maybe I'm understanding it incorrectly. <clears throat> so if I'm, let's say, on a station, I'm on a laptop, I can see how that applies. Mm. So in this day and age, let's say, as in U.S., for example, we pay either a couple ways to pay it. Uh, either in a, in a form of cash or in a form of credit card. Mm -hmm. um, on service, it's very smooth, but it's the, on, the, on the back end, it's very clunky, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say, if, let's say if I'm going to, as uh, transacting, if I'm going for a meal, how would your concept work mm -hmm. as a regular commerce from that perspective? Thank yeah, you. great question. Um, so, so just to make sure I understood it right, it's like how would like a retail payment work over something exactly. like Interledger? Um, and so I think the, the answer to that is, um, if you think about Interledger as this very raw foundational technology, um, just like the internet, you need other protocols that are built on top to get to these more specific use cases. Um, so for web monetization, we're using SPSP, which is a pretty simple protocol built on Interledger, um, but it still solves a lot of problems that we have to solve. Like one of them is um, you need to identify if you're paying the right person, and so we're using HTTPS for that. So there's kind of a HTTPS URL, um, that's, uh, we call that a payment pointer. Think of it like an email address for money. Um, and so we resolve that payment pointer using HTTPS and that gives us a 
uh, cryptographic secret, and then that ties into the Interledger layer. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be built on top of just raw Interledger. Um, and so in the world of retail payments, um, you know, I have a little bit of experience with that based on my attempts to get Bitcoin acceptance from merchants or um, you know, kind of going to merchants and like talking to them about what they need out of a payment protocol. One of the things we kept running into when we were doing Bitcoin um, payments uh, was that Bitcoin is a pure push system, right? So the, every transaction, every time money moves, it has to be signed by the sender. And so you can't do something like, um, you know, put a hold on an account when you're getting a hotel room or uh, put your Bitcoin account in and then they charge you in a recurring way. Um, if you do that, then you're no longer using true Bitcoin, you're using some OAuth thing or something built on top of it. And so now that we're kind of starting to design some of the retail payments protocols for Interledger, we're trying to learn from that experience. And so uh, my colleague Adrian is very active in um, uh, building some of those protocols. They have currently a very young, very new proposal they call OpenPay or OPay. Um, and basically what it does is um, it's a protocol for um, payment negotiation and authorization. Um, and it's designed for use cases like um, online uh, e-tail. Um, and then basically that could be a step towards true like brick and mortar retail in the future. So, um, you know, as somebody who has a little bit of background in the payment industry, like I know how many problems need to be solved before we can go out to the store and pay with Interledger, um, but we're starting that process now. So if anyone's interested in getting involved, like Interledger Community Group is a great place to start or Interledger.org. Um, there's also a forum on Interledger.org, forum.interledger.org. Um, so go ahead and check those venues out and there's a lot more information on that. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes, of course. Just a quick follow-up. Mm. So if you look at, uh, pretty amazing if you go to China. Mm. Ha China literally has sort of what I call um, leapfrog a generation in terms of payment. Yeah. Um, they still use credit card, but it's mostly non-credit card. Yeah. So it's really uh, interesting how they use QR code and scan it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two years ago was my first time experiencing that. So I went to a small store, and even the street, it, we, you know, people were begging for money. They use QR codes. Amazing society. <laughs> anyway, to make the story short, do you? Th I mean, if, for, uh, for for many reasons. So I think last I checked, I think the U.S. the China's pay, uh, digital payment system, I think it's 11 times bigger than the U.S. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I think uh, the, the short question is, do you think I'll, in, at least in the US, for various reasons we're not doing that, or very minimally, um, obviously, you know, there are a lot of lobbying groups for big credit card companies, uh, a lot of pushback, no surprise. Do you think, uh, is that the payment form for the US next, or do you think we're gonna uh, jump to leapfrog it, or are you think payment will stay because of the, the powerful group where we're in? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So, so I think the problem that Intelligent is trying to solve is the interoperability globally. And so, um, you know, I, having been to China, like um, I had an experience where I stood in front of a machine that was supposed to be an ATM, but it didn't have any slot to put in a credit card. And so my colleague and guy uh, came up and, and he just held his phone up to it and money came out. But I, I'm holding my card and I just don't know how to do that. And so. Um, basically, I think like right now you have that situation where like in, in China and in Africa you have mobile money, in Europe you have this patchwork of services as well as SEPA payments on the bank side. In the US you have credit cards and, and other things. And so there isn't like a true universal standard for it. And, and that's what Interledger is trying to be is kind of like um, you can use different systems in different countries. Um, you know, again, coming from the blockchain space, you know, we've seen the spectrum, and I think Rachel kind of made some reference that where, you know, some countries are embracing blockchain and they even have like national blockchain initiatives like China. Um, some countries have big private initiatives like Facebook's Libra and, and Ripple. Um, and then some countries have banned cryptocurrency outright. And so you have this like, diversity globally, and I think that's a good thing. It's good that different um, use cases demand different solutions and we have some, some variation, variability. Um, but we need some way to, when I'm traveling or if I'm dealing with companies abroad, um, how do I transact and, and making that more frictionless. Um, and that's when you're crossing boundaries. That's when you go from one system to another. Um, and that's what Interledger is really good at, is, is sort of like tying together systems globally. Any question, any other questions? Okay. Sunil, yeah. Um, let me run to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you get special service. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sunil. I work for Bank of New York Mellon, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, how do you resolve uh, the identity of the user to make sure the user is who the user is saying? Mm -hmm. 
And how do you validate that? Because for the banks and other folks in the financial industry, it's a must that we need to know that because we want to avoid fraud and money laundering. Second, in how do you identify on the other side who the person who is selling the? How do you validate that? Because we don't want anybody, uh, you know, selling wrong stuff and getting money or creating fraud stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me unpack that question. And, and as I'm sure you know, there's a million things to that. Um, so I'll try to touch on some of the, what I think the most important sub points are within that question. So um, first of all, the way that you identify the merchant um, is generally speaking left up to the application layer protocol. Um, so I can't answer it for intelligent general, but only for the application layer protocols. Um, and so in SPSP, the way it works is that um, the merchant has an HTTPS server, um, and so they, on their hopefully HTTPS-enabled website, when they initiate something like a payment request through Web Payments API, um, they provide that URL um, that is also HTTPS-enabled. And so when the browser resolves that URL and gets the actual payment details that then get passed to the Interledger layer, um, you know, hopefully all of, like, or that all goes over TLS, basically um, HTTPS. Um, and then in the Interledger layer, the way it works is that um, every packet um, has two phases. Um, so in the first phase, we're sending a packet from, or we're sending the packet from the sender to the receiver. Um, and then in the second phase, we are sending a, what we call a fulfillment that is going from the receiver back to the sender. Um, and it's only the fulfillment that actually creates a financial obligation. And that does some important things. One of those things is that um, if a packet gets lost in the first phase, then no money is lost. Um, you can just resend the packet, it will time out, and all the money will be returned. Um, if it fails in the second phase, what happens is that whoever failed to forward it, so the router that failed to forward it, they now have an outgoing obliga obligation they have to pay, and they don't have an incoming obligation to cover it. So they have a very strong incentive for that not to happen and make sure that their routers are as reliable as possible. Um, and in, for the use case that you mentioned, which is identifying the right destination, well, this second um, packet or this fulfillment packet, it has the pre-image to a hash that was included in the, what we call the prepare packet, that first part. Um, and so only the truly intended recipient can actually generate a fulfillment because only they know that pre-image. Um, that is the one little piece of cryptography that we had to add as a dependency, but fortunately it's only symmetric hashes. It's not anything super fancy like a the curve crypto or any asymmetric crypto. Um, and so that's why we felt relatively comfortable with it. We also think that it's quantum secure, so it'll be useful for, for quite a while. Um, you also asked about how the user is identified. Um, and so again, I have to break that down into several pieces. Um, one is uh, from a pure authentication standpoint in terms of like, is this person authorized to spend that money? Um, the way that is handled is, um, if I recall that chart earlier with the, um, I won't pull it up right now, but basically the different layers. The bottom layer is the one that um, is responsible for authenticating the user. Um, and so that's again a protocol that could change and evolve and get better um, without having to change Interledger protocol. Um, once we have Interledger protocol, it just assumes that the underlying layer has uh, solved authentication somehow. Um, and in the case of the protocol we're using at the moment called BTP, um, what we do is we use uh, WebSockets and then a um, basically the secure WebSockets, so or WSS, and then a, um, uh, an authentication packet that gets sent over WSS. Um, I think BTP is probably one of the protocols that also needs some work and, and will evolve to be better. But again, it's not, um, Interledger itself is not dependent on BTP. It could use any protocol underneath. Um, final point, <laughs> sorry for the long answer, but it's a big topic. Um, there's also user authentication, which is more from a sort of regulatory compliance perspective. So if you're sending a payment to a merchant, for example, um, some, so there might be some rules like the travel rule where information about the user has to travel with the payment. Um, and so in order to address those kinds of use cases, we believe that you can build that into the uh, higher level protocol. So when you um, do the pre-negotiation for a payment, um, you include that information, whatever is required, based on the use case, which again could be very different. For example, when we do web monetization, we don't include any information because disclosing information about the user would be a huge privacy problem if it happens with every single website you go to. But then if you're sending like a million dollars, that, that kind of flips and suddenly you have to identify who the user is. So um, that's kind of some you know, examples of how we address those things. Thank you.
We can have another uh, one last question if there's any uh, questions. Yes, one more question. Uh, uh, I'm Sandeep from Citigroup. Uh, the question relates to in terms of the launch of your platform, what do you believe are the next steps for essentially a broad-based adoption and commercialization? Yeah. Great question. Um, so from our perspective, there are a lot of um, independent platforms out there. And a lot of them either have a subscription already or they're thinking about launching one. And so what we're looking for right now is um, sites or platforms that either have a lot of reach, but not a lot of premium content that people would pay for. So they have a lot of users, but they don't have anything to sell them. Um, and then platforms that have um, not very many users, but they have amazing content that nobody knows about. Um, and the idea is that if you can get those parties, those platforms to adopt the standard, you're, by, you're essentially bundling them together. You're saying like, hey, here's this subscription that you've learned about over here um, that gives you all these benefits over there. Um, and so suddenly you're creating a much better value proposition for each of those platforms than what they would be able to do individually. Um, so that's kind of our early strategy. Uh, one example for a platform on the reach side um, is uh, Imager. So we invested in Imager this year. Uh, they have 300 million daily active users, one of the top 20 websites in the US. Um, and so they're going to um, be able to reach a lot of people and tell them about web monetization. And so on the other side, we're talking to a number of partners that have really premium content. But again, like they want to get more users. They want to get more awareness about that content. And so um, we could essentially bundle that together and have um, you know, a single value proposition. And from the user's perspective, it's kind of like, well, you know, I, I might be browsing Imager one day, and it says like, hey, there's this new uh, feature. Uh, it's like a premium version, and I can get um, you know premium benefits on Imager, um, depending on what those might be. It might be no ads, things like that. Um, and then there are extra content and premium benefits I get on this list of other sides. Um, and so that's kind of the idea, is, is to create a value proposition around um, a specific user uh, using some of those early adopter platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Stefan. Thanks a lot. Yeah.